welcome everybody to the Florida Veterans for Common Sense uh, webinar this evening. We have a really exciting program lined up with uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Vinman tonight. And uh, so without further ado, we're going to move right along and we're going to have Dave Sigwald uh, introduce uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. And Dave is one of our terrific board members. He does great work for our group. And uh, Dave was a Marine Corps major in Vietnam. So Dave, with that, I'll take it away. Well, I, I appreciate the promotion, Gene, but I, I only made it to captain. So. Oh, I'm but sorry. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe you can send the extra pay this way anyway. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we're all familiar with the words of Thomas Paine. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. When you read Hear Right Matters by Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, you'll get some understanding of the price he paid to help protect your democracy. He saw a looming crisis and he knew he, knew he had no other choice. He had to stand and he had to take action at great personal sacrifice. He deserves both our love and our thanks. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our guest and our friend, Alex Vindman. Thanks, Dave, for that lovely uh, introduction and Gene uh, and uh, Rich for put, helping put all this together. Um, so, you know, what, what kind of Lieutenant Colonel uh, writes a book, right? Uh, but it, it, especially about himself, it's, it's odd. But in this case, um, I received a bunch of uh, letters of support, you know, thousands of letters of support. You guys reached out to me. Um, there was all, there were, there were people attacking me on the right and uh, people uh, applauding me on, on the left and stuff like that. And I thought it would be a good way kind of to address the, the why and the, the how of, uh, of, the, of the events around uh, the impeachment of Donald Trump, the first impeachment of Donald Trump kind of strange to describe it as the first impeachment, but yeah. Um, so I thought it would be worthwhile to, to talk about the why, uh, what it was that I was, or that I sensed that was in danger. There's a, a notable portion of the book when I walk, walk into, after the phone call, I walk into my twin brother's office um, on the way to report it to, to senior officials. Um, and I tell him, you know, close the door, give him a dramatic pause. I say, Eugene, if what I'm about to tell you ever becomes public, the president will get, would, will get impeached. I mean, I, I knew the gravity of the moment right away. Uh, and I go into the, the backstory on uh, this, this enterprise to try to steal an election, to tip the scales uh, in the president's favor. You know, something that we as uh, uh, military, as Americans expect uh, to have free and fair elections. And it, it offends this, our sense of justice when, when people cheat. Um, and then just the general sense that, um, you know, there was, this was undermining U.S. national security. So I talk about all these things. And then I talk about the, the uh, so that's the why. I talk about the how, which is what was it in my background? You know, what my, uh, my immigrant story, my um, decades of, of military service, my, uh, you know, with the, the, the unique experiences that I had, uh, both successes and failures, that contributed to navigating something that's really kind of unprecedented. A Lieutenant Colonel going up against the President of the United States because the President did something wrong. The President acted against the Constitution. And uh, you know, I I was standing to defend the Constitution. So how did how do you do that? And then I talk about like all the things I learned as a as a young infantryman about navigation and kind of, you know, uh, uh, understanding getting your bearings and understanding where you are. Uh, that's like physically, but also, um, you know, in, in the metaphysical sense. And I talk about um, what I learned about risk and that it's not just a calculation about consequences. It's also a, cal a calculation about probabilities. And it's, there's uh, some thinking behind, you know, not being self-deterred, whether it's for personal, to protect myself, protect my career, which was on the ascent or uh, to do something, you know, that, that duty compelled me to do. And I talk about, um, you know, perspective, serving in all sorts of places overseas, 
and understanding where for places where right doesn't matter, um, like Russia, like North Korea, like uh, Iraq, um, in places, and uh, why I I wanted to, to make sure that I I helped make right matter in the United States, and so this is that's really what the story the book is about. It's a story about you know what were the critical elements in my life that contributed to to dealing with these challenges. It's a pretty positive spin for somebody that got uh, that you know lost his lost his job, you know just uh, as the uh, 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 as the career, frankly, was in a lot of ways taken off. So you think generally, if you, uh, I was going to say, Gene, you, you go ahead, Gene. No, I was going to say, uh, Alex, do you want us, are you comfortable if we move right into uh, questions? I am happy to take questions. I didn't know if you, or you guys want more on, uh, on, the, on the story. I mean, it's, uh, I'm happy to, to ask, answer questions or. Uh, you know, I think you, first, before we go into questions, we would love to hear more about the story. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I came to, to prominence, um, public prominence uh, from a background where I was was behind the scenes, uh, working quietly as a professional known to really, you know, relatively small group of, of uh, national security uh, experts. Uh, I came to prominence as a um, witness, uh, I guess a key witness to uh, President Trump's uh, abuse of power. And um, I think you know, a fair number of people probably saw my uh, testimony in front of Congress, but that was, there were only really two clear points where I kind of had to help shape the narrative, my opening statement, uh, both in the closed door testimony and in the, in the public testimony where I, I talk about um, what was at stake. I talk about the, the challenges I had with my own dad that uh, you know, was deeply concerned about my well-being and uh, challenging the president of the United States. And um, I focused not on like, you know, what uh, I think a lot of my counterparts focused on about you know, providing support to Ukraine. I focused on U.S. national security, why it's important to the U.S. national security to to uh, support Ukraine. And I think uh that seemed to res that the back the the uh, immigrant background as a refugee, the decades of military service seems to resonate with the uh, uh, the American public, and made me uh, the target of uh, President Trump's ire, uh, where he proceeded to tweet about me, and then not only was he was he keen on on having me removed from the White House, but he also proceeded to orchestrate a campaign of re retaliation and, and bullying, and I'm definitely not one to get bullied. Um, you know, while I was, uh, when I went back to the, to the Pentagon and in that, uh, capacity, basically, you know, uh, held up a promotion list for hundreds and hundreds of Lieutenant colonels that were waiting on a disposition, uh, on whether they were promoted to, to Colonel, just because my name was on the, was on the promotion list and, um, really made it, uh, and hauled in the secretary of defense and the secretary of the army and berated them for, uh, you know, this was the, the, the chief of staff, the president's chief of staff. Mark Meadows, um, you know, so I, I left the military. Now I'm uh, all but dissertation for my doctorate from Johns Hopkins. I'm at a think tank as a, a, a military fellow. I, um, I'm affiliated with a couple of academic institutions as a, a visiting fellow. Uh, I'm on the board of an NGO that advocates for de a democratic renewal, the Renewed Democracy Initiative. Um, just doing all sorts of kind of interesting things, writing quite a bit and tr still trying to serve in a way out of uniform. You know, Alex, one thing that uh, you mentioned and, and most of the audience would probably understand it, but it may be in a little in the weeds for some of them. And uh, as we know, there's some writers that uh, sometimes they're a little too technical for a general audience. Yeah. And uh, so explain the abuse of power. Yep. So uh, there were there were two charges against um, President Trump. Frankly, I don't recall the, the 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 verbiage for them both. But the abuse of power is the president demanding an investigation into a political rival, or frankly, uh, it wasn't just simply demanding an investigation, calling uh, a uh, putting pressure on a foreign power to orchestrate an investigation to provide compromising information on, on a political rival to um to 
aid in a in a um, in a uh, election campaign, uh, you know, seeking a second term in office. The, the the other key matter was the president ordered a hold on security assistance, three hundred ninety seven million dollars that Congress appropriated for Ukraine, and that the executive branch is obligated by law to spend. Uh, in the way that's the because the Congress controls the purse strings. That's always been the way our system worked. It's part of the checks and balances. And then Congress directed uh, a funds to be uh, uh, spent in a particular way. The president froze those funds to to apply pressure on the Ukrainians. And um, this was in violation of uh, the Pound uh, Impoundment Act and a bunch of other issues. And uh, Congress impeached them for for it. So an another interesting follow-up on that, uh, Alex, is how did the Ukraine Ukrainians manage to deal with all that pressure? Uh, I don't re I don't remember anything in public that uh, yeah. uh, how they responded specifically, but that must have put the leadership yeah. of the Ukrainian <laughs> government at a terrible spot. It it, it did. Uh, Ukraine is currently is, is still in a state of war with Russia, with Russian uh, troops on Ukrainian territory. Um, Killing Ukrainian soldiers, and uh, the it, it was an immense amount of pressure uh, on the Ukrainians to you know get get that aid. Um, I knew, I remember when I visited as the White House representative to to Zelensky's inauguration. I specifically counseled President Zelensky to not get involved in U.S. Uh, domestic politics because that was would destroy bipartisan support for Ukraine. One side or the other would be would be angry about it. In a way that's kind of played played out. Uh, Support from the Republican side has weakened because it's politically expedient to serve the president's interests and uh, treat Ukraine harshly. Uh, but the answer to your question is, Gene, is that frankly they almost uh, faltered. About two days before a scheduled press conference between uh, President Zelensky and CNN, uh, that's when news broke of um, Congress conducting. You know, three different con committees conducting an investigation into a f uh, the hold on on security assistance. This four hundred billion, a uh, four hundred million dollars for Ukraine. So, if it didn't, un it, President Zelensky was about to to potentially deliver on President Trump's demand uh, because he was obviously most keenly concerned about Ukraine's national security interests and thought that it, uh, you know seemed to calculate that this is the way to get the the funds released. And why, why did they decide not to do that? What, what tipped the balance? What tipped the balance is uh, some, some fortuitous timing that the congressional committees launched an investigation and President Trump immediately lifted the hold on security assistance. He was caught, handed the cookie jar, he lifted the hold on security assistance, and then the, the Ukrainians no longer felt pressure. Well, that, that's, that's quite an interesting turn of events because without that fortuitous timing, uh, we could have had a real problem. It would have been an enormous problem because, uh, again, uh, eventually uh, some of this, you know, nothing, the truth, truth uh, uh, the truth would come out. This is, this is one of the things that people uh, should understand is conspiracies are uh, comical because things just don't, aren't kept secrets. Uh, especially in the uh, leaky sieve of, of Washington, D.C. So the truth would eventually come out. It would become clear that the Ukrainians delivered an investigation as a result of uh, Trump's pressure, and that would have completely broken our relationship with Ukraine. Ukraine is, is, is vital to U.S. national security interests because it's the fulcrum for turning Russia from a inveterate enemy and adversary to, uh, uh, you know, potentially over the long term, a different path. Because where Ukraine goes, Russia will ultimately follow. And uh, that, that's we were basically sure that. Why, why is that? that? So there is a very famous line from Zygnu Brzezinski, the national security advisor for, uh, for Carter, that said, it should not be underestimated. That, uh, Russia, absent Ukraine, ceases to become a, an empire but Russia with Ukraine subordinated and suborned automatically becomes an empire. Ukraine was the heart, the, the heart of the military industrial complex of the Soviet Union. It's a population of 43 million people. 
it's a uh, uh, it's a has a wealth of, of resources, and uh, frankly, in a way, it's untenable for Russia to remain an authoritarian uh, stronghold if Ukraine is a prosperous uh, de- democracy. It's there's too much uh, there are too much uh, too many ties. There are some ten or or, or more uh, estimates run as high as twenty million Ukrainians of Ukrainian ethnic origin that live in, in Russia. And uh, you know, the, the ties still remain pretty tight. So it's in, untenable for Russia to, to, to maintain an authoritarian regime if Ukraine prospers. And I think you know, if we help Ukraine prosper, then it, it eliminates in a way over the long term, you know, this is not wishful thinking, but over the course of decades, it, it um, recasts a Russia in a different direction. Very interesting. I've been uh, dominating the questions, and I know there's people that have sent uh, questions in, Alex, so I'll give others the opportunity. Dave, do you have any specific questions or comments? Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of questions, um, and I wanted to ask Alex if he would comment on, on how he sees China um, and the role of China involved with the Russian and Ukrainian relationship. How do they play into this? Okay, this is just for you guys, all right? Don't share it. But uh, I'm, ri- I'm writing I'm writing my dissertation on uh, the impact of Russia Ukraine on US foreign policy. And I have this theory that um, the holy grail of uh, US foreign policy right now is how to figure out how to drive a wedge between Russia and China. Nobody's quite figured out how to crack that code. But I just kind of gave you part of that formula. The way you do that is you you reshape Russia based on a thriving, successful Ukraine, because it can't be the only holdout in a region that's successful. You recast it where it no, you no longer have a Putinist regime that's focused on uh, demonizing the West because the systems are irreconcilable, democracy and authoritarianism. And the, the, then a, a, a different regime that assesses Russian national security interests clear, purely on the merits, on you know what are the, the real threats, not like some you know uh, imagined threat from a democratic West, but the real threat of uh, economic pressure, uh, demographic pressure, militarization between Russia and China. That's how you you split them apart. So that's why Ru- Ukraine is so central to uh, it, the the book that I'm writing. Ukraine is so central to U.S. foreign policy because. This actually keeps the the uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, Russia and China, from converging in, into a, a behemoth that makes it much much more challenging for us to um, to to face. Uh, in terms of priorities of threat, ultimately China will of course be the the, the more significant threat because of economic uh, power, uh, military mo- modernization, population size, um, all sorts of different elements of power. But in the short run probably for at least the next three to five years, Russia to me is still the, the preeminent threat. And the reason is uh, my calculations are be- based on, uh, you know, uh, um, an analysis of, of uh, capability and intent. Russia has the capability to cause a lot of harm. They've been mucking around in cyberspace and information uh, can- uh, domain with corruption and uh, illicit finance. But they also have demonstrated the, the intent to upend the system. Russia, China, on the other hand, is a little bit more ambiguous. They have potent capability, but their intent is to squeeze more uh, benefits out of the current international order. Putin has said he wants to upend the international order. China may want to just, you know, as a rising power, may want to accrue some more of those benefits for itself. It's it's a little bit less clear, and that's why Russia, in the short term, is the is the preeminent risk. Let me ask one other question, and then I'll pass it on to Rich. But uh, can you comment on the uh, Ukraine and Russian policies with regard to Iran? Uh, Ukraine and Russian policies with regards to Iran. Um, you know, Russia is obviously Ukraine is going to is has been a excellent partner. Uh, they've contributed to our missions in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, uh, even though they're not part of any formal alliances. And they've respected our wishes, you know, to to uh, their own potentially, uh, you know, 
to, to some economic detriment because they could, of course, benefit from selling advanced capabilities to, to, to Iran. Russia, on the other hand, has been a, a significant arms supplier, has been a backer of Iran uh, in a lot of ways, um, you know, not to not they're not interested in, in Iran uh, developing weapons of mass destruction, but they will, will take an opposing position with regards to the, let's say the strong position that the U.S. took with uh, uh, the, the agreement with Iran during the, the Trump administration. So I think uh, Russia is just not, uh, we will find Russia on the opposite side of uh, our interactions with regards to Iran, um, North Korea, China, any place that we're facing challenges, they're, they're going to be, um, they're, they're, they're going to be a spoiler or make our lives harder. Thank you, Alex. I'll turn it over to Rich. I know you got questions, Rich. Okay, well, we have a number of questions from the audience. Um, so I'm gonna get to those first. Uh, and the first is from Cody Keller. And he'd like to know, Alex, if you're able to draw your army pension. Yes, uh, I retired um, at 21 years, uh, six months and 10 days of, of service. So um, you will find, I, I find it amusing that I received my retirement orders. I submitted them on a Wednesday and received them on a Friday. How do you like that for being, <laughs> bre breaking through army bureaucracy? Uh, not not the six record. months or a year. Yeah, it's a record. And uh, and then I was actually out. Uh, how long do you think it took? It took less than three. I, I had my I had everything but my final out by the, uh, that following Monday. That's the only thing that was left. I had my final out, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the month, two days before the end of the month, just because, uh, you know, changing uh, ID cards, but everything else was completed in days. Uh, I think the message of whether I was welcome or not was pretty clear. Um, but yes, I've got uh, retirement and, you know, now also drawing disability, uh, you know, uh, based on uh, years of military service, which many of you guys could understand. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, the next one is from Michael Burns, uh, and he wants to know, are there units in the army that would support an insurrection? Units in the army that would, I would say no. Uh, I would say um, there has been some radicalization in, in certain areas. Frankly, I, I find it disturbing, but I've heard, uh, uh, I've heard friends talk about uh, the special force community being kind of more radicalized than, than, than a lot of other places. Um, so that's pretty disturbing, but that's not units, that's individuals. And I, I don't think you would find, I mean, I spoke on this extremely confidently, actually, uh, just days before uh, January 6th, sometime in, in Dece uh, late, late December of, um, of 2020, saying that there was no way that the military would support an insurrection. Now that's different from let's say uh, folks maybe not responding as rapidly as they should have either because of um, risk aversion, which you guys could understand. Like you know, the military tends to be pretty risk averse, or uh, or sometimes because they read the political tea leaves in a way that uh, would have suggested you know inaction is better than action. But I, in no way does that you know connect with like military units. Uh, uh, stepping out in, in um, certainly not active duty. I don't know. I mean, there might be some crazy National Guard units out there in, in certain corners of the country, but uh, not, not active duty military. All right. Uh, great. Thanks. As a follow-up, um, how serious do you think the insurrection on January 6th was? And what do you think the long-term effects will be? It's It was quite serious uh, as an assault on... Um, on the image sounds very trite, but on the the ideal of the of U.S. democracy, to have insurrectionists inside the Capitol building, you know, marching with with um, with Confederate flags and you know uh, Nazi and fascist kind of uh, uh, banners and stuff like that is is really really troubling. Uh, but it's more than just kind of um, on, on the ideal of U.S. democracy. I think, frankly, it showed that 
uh, folks have been sufficiently radicalized to take up arms against the government. Uh, and that's something that we haven't experienced in, 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 in a long, long time, uh, certainly since the Civil War. Um, there's also an underlying issue with, with uh, that hasn't been addressed from the Trump administration, and that is a lot of corruption and misdeeds that just haven't been brought to light. They're slowly coming out. You know, today there was reporting about uh, Chairman Milley and his deep concerns about uh, uh, the president, you know, either launching nuclear weapons or conducting an insurrection and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and there's, you know, repeated reporting about the, the damage done to various departments and agencies. And those things haven't been addressed. Um, and I am a little bit, I'm frankly, I'm pretty critical of the Biden administration. I fully understand they have a full plate. They have a, a, a platform that they were elected on that they would like to fulfill. They've got a, a, a as always, there's a cri crisis somewhere and they're dealing with crises, but we can't bring this country together until we uh, start to treat wounds from the previous four years, the big lie about stolen elections. If anybody tried to steal elections, it was, it was Donald Trump. About COVID, uh, we need to address these issues. Uh, we need to address the corruption. Uh, we, need to, we need to treat these wounds so, so we could actually start coming together. Uh, and you know, maybe all but the, 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 the most extremist, I think we could, we could pull back into our, um, you know, a group of uh, patriotic Americans. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, the next is from Steve Martin. And he says, it's a great honor to be here tonight. You exemplify what it makes, what makes this nation great. Uh, and the question is, how could Trump's call to Ukraine be interpreted as anything mm -hmm. other than Tony Soprano style extortion? And why did Giuliani get so much access when he wasn't even a member of the State Department? <clears throat> you know, uh, I'll, my twin brother, when he was trying to explain the sterile transcript to his uh, then 16 year old son, uh, you know, some, some, some of these things out of context might not resonate, but all he did was add like a, you know, uh, a New York mafia Don voice to his read, reading of uh, Trump's lines and it became very, very clear. So just some voice, you know, proper or a, a proper voice in there. But um, in addition to that, uh, you know, my initial thoughts on Giuliani were that he was just a self-serving, you know, nasty guy that was looking to get be benefit himself by ingratiating himself with the president by just causing a bunch of trouble. So I'm now outside or outside of government. What became clear to me is that uh, it wasn't just him as an outsider, a non-government official, but people inside of government that were that were uh, aiding him. And we saw that in uh, with Donald, uh, with uh, Gordon Sondland with other uh, officials that had maybe, they believed they were doing the right thing. They thought that they could convince the Ukrainians to conduct a transparent election, get over the hump of this, this issue with regards to investigations and start bringing the countries together. But to me, that's doing the, uh, the wrong things for the right reasons. And that, that's just, that's not acceptable. I mean, uh, I, I try to pride myself on doing the right thing in the right way. Uh, and it's a slippery slope to kind of just to, to, to be expedient and, and sacrifice um, principles just to get the job done. It's dangerous. And he, he, did, he didn't get, you know, frankly, he did not get a lot of access to um, official State Department uh, professionals. What he did get access to were political appointees that helped him move his enterprise along. That's what it was. It was political appointees that helped him move his enterprise along, not the career State Department folks, you know, working in embassies and stuff and stuff like that. Thank you. Um, the next is from Susan Hicks, and she'd like to know uh, about the group you're working with that is focusing on democratic renewal. It's called the Renew Democracy Initiative. Um, it was uh, established by a, a, a guy that you may or may not know, especially if you play chess, you'd know him, uh, Gary Kasparov, the chess grandmaster. He's a political dissident. Uh, he's living in exile. 
um, uh, outside of Russia. And he's he brought together a pretty powerful group, bipartisan group of um, notables, uh, former senators, uh, uh, Bob uh, Kerry, uh, uh, Heidi Heidkamp, uh, other uh, uh, thinkers, uh, Michael Steele uh, of the RNC, um, Max Boot, uh, myself, and, and a couple of other folks, uh, congressmen, senators, other, other folks, to try to uh, generate some ideas and bring some attention to the hazards facing our democracy. Uh, I joined the, the group in um, at the very, very end of uh, 2019 and no correction, 2020. Yeah, I guess it, uh, it was 2020. And, um, you know, my one of my very first activities besides uh, taking part in like a couple of um, Zoom calls was after January 6th, convening all these these folks to, to start a campaign as a brushback to the, the, the hatred and divisiveness of January 6th. So we started a campaign called uh, um, um, What Does Democracy Mean to Me? A hashtag Renew Democracy. And I did a video, a bunch of other folks did video. I mean, there were many dozens of these videos. Uh, you know, uh, we did, we in parallel, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger did a video that went viral that was on, on, on the same theme. Um, and now we're doing some more stuff with regards to dissidents from other countries and what they experience in the absence of democracy. I'm writing something with a, with a uh, dissident from Belarus, which, is, which has uh, uh, one of the longest running dictatorships and uh, about the, the, the perils he, the, this gentleman faced, former minister that was beaten and uh, almost killed because he stood up to uh, to an authoritarian, and you know, I lost my job. I think you know that that's pretty modest compared to, to the, the 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 threats other people's face uh, other people face. But we could end up if we're not vigilant about protecting this democracy. So that's what the Renew Democracy uh, Initiative is is focused on. And uh, yeah, please check out the website and uh, you know um, see if there's something that you'd like to participate in. Uh, thank you. The, uh, essentially a follow-up question. Uh, considering your actions involved, speaking up involved the president and his office, did you ever personally uh, feel for your life? Um, you know, it was endangered from, for retaliation. You know, I, I never really feared for my life. I, I know this country, I, you know, I did at least not like from from the government, of course, there are, there are uh, uh, crazies out there, and people have um, have attempted to intimidate and threaten me. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> I I have I had some pretty interesting, unique training as an attaché serving in Russia, so I am mindful of uh, my force protection, uh, and um, you know. Did, wasn't in a position where I really kind of, uh, where I was keenly concerned about my, my, my own safety. My wife, I was obviously deeply concerned about the family safety. She's in charge of safety. I'm in charge of fun, um, according to my daughter. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I wasn't, I, I, maybe I, I probably downplayed it, uh, 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 some of the safety risks, but, uh, I wasn't overly concerned about it. My, as a matter of fact, I frankly felt more support than than uh, uh, supporters than detractors um, during most of this. Okay, uh, here's one from Victor Madison. How would you describe the approach towards Russia by John Mearsheimer and the late Steve Cohen? Uh, I, I'm guessing you're referring to uh, offshore balancing and realpolitik. Um, I'm not. Is that I'm not yeah. sure that it just, yeah. just yeah, take I know. your best um, shot. <laughs> so uh, I think it's, uh, it's a, let's see, let's see. How, uh, what is he saying in the, in the. It, it's see. Victor Madison there. Yeah. Um, okay. Got it. Uh, so I would say that it's, uh, I don't necessarily agree with that, with that perspective. I fully understand that the need to, to, to use uh, John Mearsheimer's you, uh, um words to husband uh, America's strength, to focus on challenges we have. I think in a lot of ways, that's what, what President Biden is trying to do. 
uh, strengthening the kind of the underlying uh, foundation of American power, economic prosperity, cohesiveness. Uh, but we can't abrogate our responsibilities overseas. We have allies, uh, alliances and, and allies uh, that we have responsibilities to um, that have been uh, with us. Uh, you know, I, I actually watched Tony Blair talk this past weekend at a conference in, in Kiev. And it was it actually was was pretty. It spoke to me because he said that uh, in our hour of need after September 11th, he had no choice but to support the United States. He was going to be there for us. And I very, very much appreciate, uh, you know, the president of uh, the, the uh, uh, PM of um, the, the United Kingdom being there for us. So we have those kinds of responsibilities. But more importantly, we face similar challenges. We face uh, it's not just us that are, are that are being subjected to, you know, uh, information operations from abroad that are suffering from, um, you know, uh, a discontent and grievance arising from um, inequality. Um, and it's not just us that are experiencing ethnocentric nationalism. And we could learn something from, from our allies and partners that could help us as well as offer them some ideas. Um, I think it's also to import, important to remember that, you know, as a relative uh, uh, portion of Global GDP, we're not where we were, uh, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago. We need alliances in order to face a rising China. Uh, we need uh, other, our allies and, um, and partners to put some skin in the game and put some resources in, into these issues. And I don't think John Mearsheimer's uh, solution is, is uh, really kind of focuses on, on, uh, on alliances. I think uh, offshore balancing you know the this this hubris about somehow being able to dip right at the right time, not too early, not too late, to step into a crisis and prevent like you know some adversary from gaining an upper hand. I think that's that doesn't uh, seem to line up with how we've uh, managed to uh, equip ourselves in in foreign affairs recently. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is actually from me. Uh, what is the likelihood that Russia is behind the Havana syndrome illnesses at the U.S. embassies? Uh, that's still being um, investigated. Uh, I think it's quite likely that they are. What's unclear is the gap between uh, our understanding of, you know, the, the different capabilities to achieve those, the, uh, to, to, to do the harm uh, that people have incurred with uh, Havana syndrome. We, we it's just hard to understand how how they're doing it because it's not you know you can't just simply point, point to microwave uh, uh, weapons that doesn't that doesn't uh, address some of these the, the symptoms that people have been facing um I think it's it's definitely a, a state actor that's behind it and Russia's a, 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 the most probable state actor all right uh, thank you the next one um, be a combination from both Steve Martin and Steve Murphy. Uh, and it's in the final days of Trump, the Washington Post states that uh, General Milley was apparently on the phone assuring China that we would not initiate a nuclear strike. So the first part was, was Trump really this loose a cannon? And second part is, what's your view of General Milley's actions that were disclosed today? The answer uh, is yes, Trump was that loose a cannon. He was unhinged uh, on January, or he was unhinged before, but he was unhinged on January 6th. But more importantly, uh, I've been pretty critical. Actually, the reason I'm going to be on CNN later this evening is I was pretty critical of, uh, um, of Chairman Milley about what he did. What uh, The actions he took uh, undermined uh, the very kind of foundation of um, the way our military act interacts with civilian leadership. We have a cornerstone is civil military relations and basically he usurped authorities uh he uh did an end run around uh chain of command where was their accountability he obviously wasn't talking to the secretary of defense that was uh that was a, tr a trump lackey so to me you you have a the senior most military officer in the in in the country uh acting without any accountability and that's dangerous 
in this case, it may have even been for, let's say it was for the right reasons. What he did requires uh, an accounting. And I think he, he probably either he needs to be removed or uh, even if he did the right thing, the, you have, cons- actions have consequences, right? He did something that uh, um, w- it was contradictory to, to norms, to procedures, and um, he's, a, he's a big boy. He's a four-star general. Uh, I dealt with the consequences for, for you know, testifying um, and was forced both out of the White House and, and out of uh, the Department of Defense. Um, unfortunately, General Milley has a, not, doesn't have the best track record uh, between parading through uh, Lafayette Park uh, after the George Floyd protests uh, started there and, and protesters were cleared out. Uh, there have been multiple reports of, of, of him, of Milley doing end runs around civilian leadership. He's probably the most controversial uh, uh, military four star since probably Ernest LeMay. And the military doesn't need him. The military just do, does not need, uh, there are plenty of very, very capable four stars uh, that do not have that kind of baggage uh, that are uh, more than capable of stepping up. He, he probably could have done more good by, you know, throwing his stars on, on the table and saying, you know, I'm not going to take part in it. Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, be party to an insurrection. The commander in chief does not represent the values of the United States. He could have done that earlier on also. Uh, he didn't do that. He, he you know, took some actions behind closed doors that are now coming out conveniently right at the moment where he's trying to get a second two year tenure. I don't know. It's too convenient for me. OK, thank you. Um, oh, switch. Topics. That's probably pretty bit. harsh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, kind of another two parter, uh, but it's a big question. Uh, what were the biggest failures in Afghanistan and Iraq? And uh, what's the future of the U.S.-Afghanistan relationship? Uh, I, I really don't think we should have been in Iraq. It was not a, a what I would call a just war. Uh, there was the reasons for us to be in there turned out to be false. Um, in a lot of ways, it might, might turn out that our involvement in Iraq might have, might actually be like, turn out to be positive because you have uh, uh, shared power amongst the three factions, the Sunnis, the um, the, um, the Kurds and the uh, Shia, uh, that seems to be enduring. Strangely enough, we'll see how, how that works out, but that was after ISIS, you know, nearly conquered, uh, the, the concrete uh, country. Uh, and that wouldn't have obviously happened if, uh, if we had never started the war, hundreds of thousands of casualties in both countries. Uh, I think that, uh, again, I think our military leaders had the opportunity if they thought that the, uh, uh, Afghanistan was failing, they had the, the opportunity to, to speak up in their testimony in front of Congress, to speak up in in these in the meetings that I had a chance to participate in in the White House, and if they didn't feel like their voices were were being heard, they could have uh, you know just spoken up like um, um, General Shinseki did. It cost him his position, but he made his p- uh, point clear uh, about what was required for Iraq in those early days. And nobody uh, had, has done that. Uh, I think the, these leaders were complicit in deceiving the American public and, and um, you know, the legislative and executive branch in potentially partially because of careerism. I think the military, frankly, is should be apolitical, but it's a large bureaucracy and they try to read the tea leaves and try to see where they could, uh, you know, um, serve the interests of the institution as well as their their own. And I think, unfortunately, uh, that has led to, to a catastrophe in Afghanistan. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, the next one's from Mike Burns, and he'd like to know how is Stanley McChrystal thought of by our military leaders and does he have credibility with the Joint Chiefs? I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a, uh, he's, he's a, he's a civilian now. I'm not sure if he uh, has or needs credibility. He's been out of uniform for, you know, uh, I guess that would have been, that would have been maybe 2014 or 13 or something like that. He's been out for almost the better part of a decade at this point. I'm not sure. He probably, uh, I don't know. I think maybe the question stems from this idea 
that um, he kind of cashed in after after le- leaving the military. And I think it's there has been inc- a, a number of di- different reports recently about where military leadership has fallen short. Afghanistan, you know, Chairman Milley t- uh, speaking behind closed doors and now coming out in books as critical of the Trump administration, but not making a peep during during the time that he uh, that uh, Trump was in power where he could have made a difference. Uh, uh, um, you know, the, the Lafayette Park thing, generals cashing in. I think sometimes the military, the honor for the military clouds the need to have better oversight over the military. I think we need Congress to, uh, and I think we'll see how this plays out over the course of the next couple of years, but really to take a critical look of where we fell short with regards to Afghanistan, why we had uh, you know two decades of reporting about progress in Afghanistan that didn't bear out in fact. And I hope just to, pr- to protect the, the military, to protect the institution, to make it stronger for the next time we face challenges, we need some, uh, some better oversight and, uh, and for folks to be held accountable. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, the next question's from Jeffrey Morris. And he'd like to know any chance of your being reinstated for the purpose of being promoted and then resigning. I, I think that there's zero chance of that happening. Um, the like I said, the Biden administration has a full plate, and they have more important things to do than to worry about you know uh, you know one one uh, uh, old lieutenant colonel um, you know and in reinstating him. I, I, I think that's needlessly. Um, they probably believe it's needlessly kind of um, provocative, you know. I mean, I've I've said some pretty provocative things in this in this conversation. I wish I could hear from some of your folks to to see if there's a, any reaction, like good or bad, on, on, on <laughs> some of these things. Mostly very good, Alex. Yeah. Okay. We're loving um, the conversation. Yeah. All right. So we're going to switch back to Ukraine now, and this question's from Tom Weber. Uh, and he uh, asks, says the U.S. public has been told repeatedly that the Ukraine leadership is very corrupt. What is your assessment of the viability of the Ukrainian government? The Ukrainian government, uh, probably this Ukrainian government is less corrupt than uh, previous Ukrainian governments. So there's progress there. Uh, corruption is still endemic. It's still a major issue. Um, but we also have this false expectation that the Ukrainians, uh, Ukraine should look like us. What we do have in Ukraine is three decades. I was there for their, their independence day on the 24th of August. Three decades of a peaceful transition of power. Except and when uh, political leaders attempted to steal elections, the population came out in mass. I think that's a good, good starting point for a country. Uh, to, that's still struggling, a new democracy to figure out, you know, the reforms it needs to carry through and the um, and the, uh, take on anti-corruption. That's a good standpoint where the a starting point where the population is not has a threshold and is not willing to, to give away their rights. Um, they do have issues. They, they keep they keep, come up repeatedly. Uh, I think, if anything, the Ukrainians kind of got, have recently gotten defensive about criticism about corruption because we've proven to proven to be imperfect there are plenty of places that you know are, are, are corrupt um and they hate to hear this uh as as the key impediment to joining nato and to joining the european union so they have a good bit of work to do but we should also understand that they've been in a state of war for uh Seven years um, will be eight in come or, or come winter, and uh, we should keep we should through partnership move them in the right direction, not through kind of like denunciations again because of the centrality of Ukraine. Uh, my my theory is that we should apply a lot more uh, resources and, and efforts to to bring them along to have them become a prosperous democratic. Uh, you know, uh, Western country. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, related is from Thomas Meehan, and he uh, asks, do you think Russia has a legitimate sphere of influence in Eastern Ukraine, given the ethnic 
composition and language? No. No, uh, it doesn't because that's uh, false history. I mean, Putin has tried this trick a, a couple times of, of writing, you know, how Ukraine is not a, 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 a independent country. Uh, it's, you know, uh, it, it's even though Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, was the the progenitor for for Russia, preceded it by. Uh, you know, 500 years or more, um, there's this so interesting thought somehow, like a false history. Uh, somebody described it as history-ish, uh, a rendering of, uh, of Ukraine as uh, just kind of an offshoot of Russia. That's just simply not true. I, I you know, I've, I, I've read uh, the, the histories. There is, um, there are, uh, I guess, commonalities in the in the slavic origins but ukraine has been independent it was conquered by russia uh uh that was at one or ukraine was at one point looking to to remain independent and sign some trees with russia in the seven, late 17th century and uh where they you know they they were going to be they were going to establish a relationship that would allow ukraine to remain uh in a sovereign uh, state and Russia obviously didn't abide by those, but they were under uh, Ukraine was under pressure from the uh, Polish Lithuanian Empire as well as uh, um, uh, Ottoman, um, the Turkish Ottoman Empire. But I, there's not not much to be said about um, about Ukraine being part of um, Russia, and the population doesn't feel that way either. All right, uh, thank you. The next question is: uh, Did the U.S. Violate any agreement with the Russians about not expanding NATO into Eastern Europe? I'm sorry, one more time. Could you say that? Yeah, sorry. Did the US violate any agreement with the Russians about not expanding NATO into Eastern Europe? Yeah, no, there is no such thing, uh, actually. Um, this is another thing I spent, spent a lot of time uh, looking into. You know, it's interesting that the conversations in the early 90s were mainly about uh, the disposition of uh, East Germany and whether there were, were there was going to be uh, a military force in East Germany. And those agreements, frankly, uh, where uh, the NATO Russia founding act, for instance, there were two different two different arguments. One is you no know, promises made to, to uh, Gorbachev. And the other one was the NATO Russia founding act that said, you know, uh, troops wouldn't be uh, in the in the current threat environment back in 1997, there, we, we did not envision trips, uh, troops being positioned in Europe, but the Russians fundamentally changed the security environment and, and precipitated, just like they did the division of Ukraine from Russia, they precipitated a different cha security environment that necessitates troops. But this, uh, with regards to this argument about whether um, there were any promises made, I think, uh, 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 but... Gorbachev's own uh, actions, where he basically accepted, uh, uh, he was looking, he, he, at one point there was a discussion. It was not, it wasn't frozen in time where basically you have a discussion about whether troops should be moved into Europe, but no decision was made. And then later on, within the span of months, uh, the Soviet Union was in dire straits and accepted uh, some hundred million dollars in in support from the uh, actually is more than that. I don't recall the amount. That's not the right amount, but I think it was significantly more than that from the Germans um, to to set aside its preconditions for uh, East and West Germany re reuniting. So what what sometimes is referred to what what people look at is like literally one transaction, but no agreement was signed, no promises uh, were made. And it's not sleight of hand. It's just that you have a conversation. This came up in this conversation, but now months down the road, there are more conversations doesn't that that have moved past that one one data point. So it just didn't happen uh, where there were promises uh, promises made. Okay, and I think and there are plenty be, of good books on this. Thank yeah. you. I think this will be uh, the last question, and this one is from Jim Derman. Uh, he'd like to know how likely is Trump. Uh, going to be able to remain a political force in America? 
Uh, I don't think he's a viable candidate in 2024, uh, mainly because he's uh, he's taken, you know, a minority. The Republicans are a minority party and he's fractured it. He's per- periodically kind of cleaved off sections of the pie. Uh, uh, and I think one, one of those major moments, he lost tens of millions of people on January 6th. He still has some a hardcore base of support, but it's no longer the 74 million people that voted for him. You know, when 81 million people voted for 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 uh, President Biden, so I think he's uh, as as a presidential candidate, he's not viable. But as a spoiler, he's enormously potent, and he's he's basically you know uh, uh, has instilled a enormous amount of fear. He can't go after everybody uh, uh, everywhere, but he can target. A couple folks and make an example out of him, and basically warn people off from breaking with him. So I think in that regard, he's likely to remain a force for for at least a couple more years. Then he's gonna, you know, when he's like squeezed as much out of he can as he can out of his efforts to get people to contribute to his campaign and you know uh, uh, enrich himself, uh, he'll he'll move off and and do some other things, but. Yeah, he's he's unfortunately he's not going away uh, just yet. Well, with that uh, note, uh, Alex, we want to thank you for uh, taking your time tonight. This has been really one of our more interesting uh, talks. This format it seems like it's worked uh, very well. <clears throat> and a couple of things I'd like to point out uh, about our group to you and also to the members and friends that may be watching. Uh, we formed an opposition to the Iraq War. Uh, We knew what a fiasco that was likely to be, uh, mainly because a lot of our founders were Vietnam era veterans. Uh, Number two, years ago, we pulled, we we, uh, called for a withdrawal from Afghanistan. We saw where that was going and we did everything we could to encourage President Obama not to get sucked into that surge business. And uh, so those are, those are two positions that we've taken that we're proud of and looking back with hindsight, they were certainly correct. And the other thing that we've pushed for for years is for more funding for the State Department. It seems like the yeah. State Department gets short changed uh, every uh, appropriation session. And uh, so we're always pushing for more funding for the State Department. And it's clear for that. that that's that's very important from the talk that you've given us tonight that we've got to do better on the diplomatic front. So with that, I want to thank you and I want to thank all the people for attending tonight. And for the people that uh, missed it, let your friends know uh, that we're going to try to have a recording of this. And uh, so Alex, we're going to let you go. Thank you. Get to CNN. Yep. And, uh, you know, if you haven't, if you want to hear some more on, on, you know, my background, go ahead and buy that book. (laughs) Well, we will too. We'll definitely support your book, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Bye, everybody.